Hi, I'm Steve O'Donnell. Um, right now I'm the CTO at Amlin, uh, which is a fairly major uh, international insurance firm uh, working in the London markets and um, in open markets as well. So we do all sorts of things like insuring um, aircraft frames and ship hulls and uh, oil pipelines in the Baltics and um, taxi fleets and uh, you can, you, you, I can go on forever about the sort of things that we insure. Pretty interesting business and a business that's really been steeped in legacy. We talk in, in the um, insurance business about things called binders, which are large bunches of paper that uh, underwriters and brokers carry through the, the, the Lloyds building. Um, literally, they're pieces of paper and people sign them and stuff like that. So we haven't quite got to the 21st century yet. Um, so I, I joined Amblin Insurance through a career of doing loads of other stuff. First time I've ever been in insurance. Um, like some of the speakers, I've been in telcos. I was global head of operations for British Telecom for a while. Um, I helped the Qatari government win the 2022 World Cup uh, hosting in Doha. So it's my fault, or partially my fault at least. Um, and uh, I've, uh, I've worked as a chief executive. I, I uh, built and sold a storage business to Oracle for a few hundred million dollars um, in the uh, la latter part of last year. Um, and I guess my, my career's all been about break, fixing things that are broken. I was going to say breaking things that are fixed, but fixing things that are broken. Um, and I treat Agile as something in my toolkit to drive a change, to drive a fundamental change in how the business actually operates. So let's just get to this. So I started off at Amlin saying, hey guys, we ought to do Scrum. And the first thing that a businessman said to me was, Scrum, where are the hookers? <laughs> Which I thought was quite funny. He did too. But then <laughs> laughing at your own jokes isn't that funny. So um, how, do, how do you actually get the business to sign up to Agile? Because very often when I talk to IT departments, and sometimes when I get brought in to fix things, I get told that the, the biggest issue isn't IT, it's the business. The business won't engage, the business won't help us, the business won't do UAT. The business thinks IT sucks ass, okay? And usually they're right. Um, actually, the business sucks ass as well because the business really doesn't help themselves. And like everything in life, like relationships, being married and having children and stuff like that, it's a two-way street. IT's got to do its stuff and the business has to do their stuff. If we want to be abused spouses in a relationship and actually get beaten by the business, then the thing to do is to let the business do what it likes. Actually, to be real leaders and actually drive IT properly, what we need to do is we need to push back and we need to say, hey, this is a joint and several relationship. If we want it to work, you guys need to do what you have to do and I'll do what I need to do. And very often what you find is that you've got this absolute quagmire of um, relationship between the business and IT and nothing ever happens that is effective or nothing ever happens that's actually aligned with business need. And so I find in, in my career that most of the time I spend my life fixing relationships, fixing the relationship between the business and IT so that IT can actually do what it's supposed to do and deliver business change. Keep the lights on, it's important, but delivering business change is usually the thing that helps you kill the competition and serve customers and drive shareholder value. And that's what business is all about. So let's talk about the rules. Um, so the rules are, it's a two-way street, but you've got to keep it simple because the business has got a very low attention span. You can think of them as a teenager with ADHD. Um, if you can get somebody to actually concentrate without getting on the Blackberry for 30 seconds, then you're doing pretty well. So you've got to keep it simple. If you try and make it complicated, it ain't going to work. And um, I, I always say projects, there are three golden rules of projects. And it doesn't matter whether you do waterfall or whether you do agile, these three golden rules don't change. You've got cost, 
you've got quality and you've got time. And you can change one of the three, but not two of the three. Mostly. You certainly can change three of three. You can't make three of the three better, unless you're a better man than I am. And I haven't met too many people like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not at all arrogant, honestly. Um, so you've got, these, you've got these three things. They, they, they don't change. Whether you're doing Agile, whether you're doing Waterfall, you've got cost, you've got quality, and you've got time. And these are the three things that you can trade off to get a delivery. And those are the rules. And um, when you start off with the Waterfall project, you kind of guess what the quality is. You kind of work out. And I thought some of the, the earlier talks from my colleagues were really good. They really outlined the fact that, you know, two years ago we talked about this and you told me you wanted this and I've delivered it now. And why are you disappointed? You know, I'm really surprised. Come on. Um, that doesn't, that's not how it works. Uh, you really have, you, you really can't nail in stone two years ago what you want now because the world changes. The world changes faster and in, in finance and technology it changes faster than in most businesses. So keep it simple. Um, you also need to get the business to buy in and uh, sometimes you, you, you need to um, some of the guys tonight said, you know, you can compromise this, you can compromise that, you can be kind of flexible. I'm going to disagree with you. I think, actually, that if you really want to make it work, you have to have a religion. Um, and that is because if you start giving way, suddenly before you know it, you've got agile fail, which is a combination of agile and waterfall. And I, I've replaced the fall piece with fail because that's what happens. You end up not achieving either. And if someone wants to compromise and they don't like Agile, I say, okay, well, hey, let's not do Agile. Let's do Waterfall. Let's stop all that stuff because it doesn't work for you. Waterfall works. Let's do Waterfall. It's okay. It's fine. Cool. So I actually think that there is a degree of religion, the things that you will not compromise on. And let me explain the core principles that you don't compromise on. If you do waterfall, the individual who's accountable for delivery is the project manager. The project manager takes it in the ass if it goes wrong. They get fired, okay? And you, you've, all, you've all been involved in projects that are tough and you've seen Five project managers have been on this one. I'm the sixth one. I'm going to do okay. I'm better than those other five guys, right? <laughs> That's called denial, right? <laughs> it is. It's called denial. And why did five project managers fail to deliver it? You have to ask yourself the question. And, um, and often it's because we don't know what the hell we're doing. Okay? So, um, so... Being religious and getting it right and being firm is important. And in, in Waterfall, the project manager is accountable. In Agile, the people who are involved in the scrum are accountable. The product owner is accountable. The developers are accountable. The testers are accountable. Why is that? Because you say to them, You've got two weeks' work to do, dude. And in two weeks, I want, to tell, I want you to tell me, I'm not putting any pressure on you, how much work are you going to do in two weeks? So you get them to commit. They commit. They've got, everybody wants to do a good job. If you say, I want you to commit to tell me how much work you're going to do in the next three months. <sighs> I ain't got a clue. I honestly... I'm a pretty smart dude, and I haven't got a clue. How much work am I going to do in three months? But how much work can I do in the next two weeks? I know how much work I can do in the two weeks because it's common. It's easy for me to do that. And I can get the individuals who are part of the Scrum to be accountable and to say, I will do this work. I will do this work in two weeks. I will commit to doing that. And the key thing that you can't change, the religion you've got to have, is you have to shift the accountability from the project manager to the members of the Scrum team who are delivering 
and committing to deliver. And that includes the business as well as the IT team, the testers, the developers, the DBAs, the infrastructure guys, Uncle Tom Cobbley and all in all who are involved in getting it done. And if you don't do that, you may as well stop or not start. So one of the things I do in every, in every um, sprint is if we're not ready to start, I don't start. Why start if you're going to fail? If the business people are not going to engage and commit and give you the time and effort and commitment to do the UAT that's required to get done done by the end of your sprint, why start? Do something else. The whole point of Agile is that you've got a backlog. Work on something else. You've got a backlog, you can skip that sprint and do another one. You can do a completely different project. In fact, if you organise yourself so that you've got a factory that delivers, something very, very fundamental happens in the business. Hey, you weren't able to give me the resources to do UAT, so guess what? I didn't do any work either. Oh, accountability. Accountability is absolutely at the core of this, and that is the core thing that gives you the business engagement you actually enable the business to be accountable to deliver stuff and you equally are accountable for delivering back to them. And um, we've heard a number of things. I, I love this stuff about epics and um, user stories. So who writes user stories? You know, it's a combination, it's, a, it's an effort that's done amongst everybody. The product owner, the scrum master, the developers all write the user stories together. Why? Because only by talking about it do you actually get to know really what it is that people actually want. And so the, the second thing that you must not compromise on is communications. So people say, hey, you know, I've got this fantastic thing. I've got all these guys in Panay. I've got people in Brazil. I've got loads of guys in Eastern Europe. And we all work together, we've got WebExes and we do Agile. Bullshit. It don't work. I have never in my career, and I've been doing this for 30 years, ever seen that stuff work. If you want to do Agile in India, send the business owner to India. Otherwise, forget it. Do waterfall. Okay. So that's how you engage the business. I've produced a few slides, just to keep it uh, real. Um, it works, but not in the way you're used to it working. Stick to the basics and the rules. Um, <coughs> the benefits for the business are gargantuan. The business doesn't have to be smart. The business can actually be smart later, once they've actually seen what smart looks like, and you can help them to understand what smart looks like. Um, you cannot get away from the basics. Cost, quality, time. There is no magic bullet, no pixie dust that gets, that gets you past that. One of the other speakers also talked about failing fast. Um, I've sold a few businesses. I ran a business last, uh, last time and sold it to Oracle. You want to fail fast because uh, if you fail fast, you're not wasting the company's money. You're not wasting the shareholders' money. You can get on and do stuff and do stuff that's effective. Um, cuts out the middleman. The middleman is the project manager and the architect. The designer is the architect. Architects love bright, shiny things. It's beautiful. It's a work of art. Look at this architecture I've created. But does the business want it? Is the architect even capable of holding a conversation with the business person? I've never found one who can, frankly. Um, Get started even when you don't know what you want. Because by starting, you get traction, you get movement, you actually get to understand more about the problem. Um, absorb changes. I've never, ever been in a project that hasn't had a change. Have you, hands up, anyone ever been in a project that hasn't had a change? There you go, point made. Um, you can actually dis delay your decision about 
which of the, the three fundamentals you're going to compromise on, cost, quality, or time. You know what, if, you make, if you're really making a fist of this and you're really driving the business benefits, why would you want to stop? Why would you want to stop spending money on it? It's great. If you're not getting the business benefits, why would you want to continue? Why would you want to spend good money after bad? And by having Agile, you actually buy that flexibility for the business. And it finds stupid quickly. Because <clears throat> how many times have we done a 90-day cycle and decided that, guess what? That's not what we really wanted. That's a bit of a piss at that one. OK. Um, the dangers of Agile, of course, for the business also are scope creep. And if you, if you lose focus on cost and quality and time, you end up with scope creep. You end up with having a backlog that just grows to infinity, a whole set of gold-plated user requirements that actually don't add any business value. Um, so you've got to be pretty firm about that. Um, one of the, the fundamental principles in Agile is that you're sacrificing code that works for documentation that works. I guess, which I'd rather have. Um, but it's an important issue, and it depends on your business model, whether documentation is a really important thing to have. Um, offshore resources, I've already pointed out, that's challenging. It's very difficult to do it. It's not impossible, but it's very difficult, and it's probably not the place you want to start. And then, if you're going to outsource your accountability, because that's the kind of business that you are, you don't want, you're the CIO and you don't want to get fired, for not delivering, let's get Ernst and Young to do this. You know, then the partner can get fired if it all work, if it doesn't work. Um, then it's kind of difficult to do agile that way too, because um, you've got a lot of difficulty in managing quality and cost and time. You can generally fix a few of them, but not all of them at the same time. Um, and and it can be a very complex contract to write. It's not impossible, and people do do it. Um, but be aware that. It's not something that you're going to just um, get off the back of the fag packet and make it work. And um, Agile is great where you don't know what you want or the business doesn't know what it wants. It's, it really works for you. Um, you don't really understand the problem and part of the, the process is actually understanding that problem. Um, you can't wait for the solution. So actually you want to get some early deliverables, you want to get something that's actually going to help the business right now, so you can actually deliver something quickly in little sprints, that can be really effective. If what you want to do is you want to make widgets, and you've made thousands of widgets, it's kind of pointless doing Agile. Why would you do that? Because you actually really want to do it in a very different way. Agile isn't for that kind of project, so choose Agile appropriately. Um, and uh, you'll find that's uh, uh, important. Um, if you want to outsource accountability, that's not going to work either. That, that's breaking one of the golden rules. And if you've got a non-cooperative relationship between the supplier and the client, don't start. You really need to have liquidated damages and service credits and all the other legal things in a really expensive legal firm to kick ass and get the supplier to deliver for you. Agile requires um, a lot of interaction between the supplier and the customer. And without that, it's just not going to work. So, do not, and a number of the, the other speakers have talked about this, don't mix Agile and Waterfall. I've spoken to so many colleagues who said, oh, we've got this hybrid thing, it does a bit of this and a bit of that. Actually, it's bullshit, it does nothing. It will fail to deliver because it breaks the rules. It's trying to mix where accountability resides between the project manager and the project delivery team. It will fail. Don't do it. If your business insists on doing waterfall, give up. Do waterfall. Don't try and force Agile on them. Um, it's much better to deliver something that will work rather than um, try and take the accountability for it and then not have the other side actually play their part. Um, agile, individual accountability, as you fail, drives unclear accountability. 
And anyone who's studied anything about business knows if you haven't got accountability and you don't know who's accountable for doing something, and remember, accountability and responsibility are two different words, they mean different things. Accountability is what matters and accountability is what you really need to track. And that's the core of making Agile work with business. Thank you. So, the other guys asked um, if you had any questions, so I'm going to do the same thing. Sir. So, most of the company uh, wants to do Agile, and they start Agile work and etc. all fine, but then finally you get a knock from your finance department that say, you know, what's your budget? How much are you going to spend? What's your timeline and month? Sure. How, do you, how do you do that? Because if you, if you want the amount of detail they want, you end up, you better be doing uh, waterfall because you have to do for analysis, design and everything. Yeah, you're, you're, you're spot on the nose here. This is, a, this is a critical and central question about which methodology to use for delivering projects. And if your finance department says, hey, we've only got a million pounds to do this project, that's fine. So if you've got an agile delivery methodology, you work out one million pounds equals X sprints. Okay, there we go. That's what we're going to do. We're going to do X sprints. And what we're going to do is we're going to drive our way through the backlog and we're going to deliver the quality that we get to by working all the way through that backlog. And just like everything else, there's no magic in this. You compromise one thing or the other. If it's fixed cost, you can do that with Agile in the same way as you can do it with Waterfall. But you can't be magic and deliver all three at once. Yeah, but most of the time they end up saying, you said you're going to do this, so your project actually failed. Because you said you're going to do all of this in this money. So okay, you you're confusing Waterfall with Agile. Waterfall talks about fixed scope and um, clear, unadulterated, unmissable requirements at the beginning of the project. And Agile talks about business outcomes. Agile talks about delivering something that's of use, that is of use to the business. And only the business can tell you what is of use to the business. And that's why the product owner or the proxy product owner are critical components of your Agile delivery. They tell you what is of business value and they will deliver that level of business value based on the time or the cost that you've got to deliver. So it's a bit of education. And you know what? If your business isn't ready for that, don't do it because you'll fail. Sir. Just to build on that. Um, David. If you've, got a, if you've got an organisation that's kind of got waterfall embedded and that's the way everything's done, yeah. you can see there's a massive benefit in Agile. How do you sell it across the whole country? Bit by bit. Um, and, 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 it, and, it, and it's kind of a, it's kind of a bit like, don't start unless you can finish. So do a small project. Do something that's really bound and, and, and is easy to scope out and show the benefits. And B, I, I talk about religion, and you know, I, obviously I'm not talking about sticking to every single rule, but stick to the basics. Keep the accountability going. Make the guys feel that they're empowered, that they actually are, they, they will commit to delivering this stuff in this time frame, and they're making the decisions and they're running it, and it works. It's a lot more standoff, but, but, but start off with something that's manageable and easy, prove the point, and then move on. Last thing you should do is try and say, well, you know what, let's try a bit of this. No, oil and water. This is not a salad dressing, okay? It is literally, uh, you've got to do one or the other, but not both. So I'm working in a business where, uh, so we try and do agile, uh, we've got a, we've got an offshore team, uh, and we do a lot of the things that they recommend in doing as well, like stand ups, the sort of retrospectives, sure. sprints, all of these sort of things. But one of the problems we find is because we're a small business, um, a lot of the business needs or the business requirements um, they get 
they change or they get brought in once the sprint has started? Sure. So sometimes that delays our user stories getting done. Um, do you think that's against agile methodology, or do you, uh, or do you think that's um, something that you know you can work with? What's your, what's your opinion on that? Because, okay. that, for example, strict agile people who do strict agile they say that when when you sort of establish your user stories within the sprint, they shouldn't change. For example, right. in okay. between sprint. Okay. So here's the thing. You've got your team to commit that they're going to deliver this stuff inside the sprint. So if something changes, the business changes its mind, and some of the requirements aren't needed anymore, you spike them. That is, you take them out and you put them to one side. Done. Not going to do that anymore. And you move on and you let the guys do what they've committed to do. You never, under any circumstances whatsoever, change what goes on in a sprint. Because what that does is it demotivates uh, the sprint team and it absolutely kills the whole concept of accountability. I will do this even if I have to have go home at 10 o'clock at night and work the weekend <coughs> because I told my gaffer I was going to do it. That's the kind of thinking that you find in my, last, in my business in Amlin. I had a culture with a four year backlog when I took over in December. And um, after seven months of implementing Agile, we got down to doing functional and uh, changes and bug fixes in real time. We, we moved from having people coming in at nine o'clock in the morning or five past, ten past nine, and going home at five, to people sometimes being in the office at 9.30 account in the evening, accountable <coughs> because they committed to doing it. And, and that is literally, it's a, that's not nothing to do with technology, it's nothing to do with techie type stuff. It's a psychology, sociology thing where you actually get people to engage and be accountable for what they say they're going to do. Now, if you've got an offshore team, um, I always find that quite challenging. And I think it's really difficult because you've, you, having your product owner and your development team separated um, so far away is really tough to actually manage things and, and manage that level of accountability and help you to build the user stories effectively. So I think some of the symptoms you talk about are symptomatic of the difficulty in communications and having clear communications, you've got to get the agile team to sit together, preferably sitting together around a single big table so that they can't avoid but communicate with each other. You've got to do things like take them out to the pub and buy them pizza and beer and make them like each other so they talk to each other and stuff like that. It's really important. You've got to pull people from different floors of your business and different parts of the country to work together. And maybe, maybe you can make it work remotely in um, offshore environments, but you've got to bring the offshore people onshore to build that level of relationship and actually help that level of communication. And it's not just about stand-ups and retrospectives and planning sessions, which, yeah, you can do with WebExes. It's actually about, shit, I don't know what I'm doing. Maybe I should ask Fred, because Fred did this last sprint. What am I supposed to be doing, Fred? And if, you, if you've not got that level of interaction, that kind of clear uh, communications, you're going to miss on that. And you're actually going to miss some of the benefits. I hope that answers your question. Now, there was another question at the back there. It wasn't so much a question, it was more of a response to um, some of the uh, companies. We, I work for the agency side, so we get the benefit of seeing multiple companies try and implement agile methodologies. And um, one of the things that I've seen successfully work on a couple of occasions are going through a process of self-determination for a small project team. Because the idea of getting a project team implemented with an agile methodology and then for be able to go to PR, communicate that around the business, yeah. obviously is a snowball effect. Um, so if you can have a project you can identify and have self-determination across a division and say, right, we're going to do this project, who wants to be involved? All of a sudden you've got an exceptionally motivated team brought together in a small way that's going to lead and increase the probability and likelihood of success and therefore you get a self-fulfilling prophecy within that. You get religion. What happens is the guys, it's true, I mean, I keep talking about this, but you get religion. You get the guys who've been involved in a, in a successful, agile implementation 
and they can't wait to tell all their colleagues, hey, this was great, I really enjoyed this. We delivered, we did something amazing that couldn't be done. And um, so the religion grows. And that's why you've got to start off with something that's manageable, um, that helps to build that, that credo. And um, how, how have we done it at Amlin? We've done it at Amlin by really engaging the business and getting the business to believe IT's changed. IT actually does want to know what we're doing. They want to really understand what the problems are. They talk to us in our language. We, we talk about user stories. We don't talk about requirements. They don't hold us accountable for screwing it up and getting the requirements wrong. You know what, if we get it wrong, we fix it in the next sprint. It's okay. And, and it really, really works. And eventually everybody says, hey, this is a much better, less conflicted way of doing business and of actually delivering user benefit. But you've got to be firm and don't compromise on the basics. What Sir? What reaction do you normally get from the business when you say that you're going to spike their requirements if they're changing their mind? <laughs> sometimes they kind of, sometimes they kind of uh, complain about it, but mostly because you're delivering, they say, yeah, okay, that's the rules, we get that. And, and actually, it means that we are allowed to change our mind. You know, we're allowed to be wrong. And human beings are wrong. Everybody's wrong all the time. And, uh, and actually, failing fast and understanding that you're doing the wrong thing is a really important precept. The faster you can fail, the less stuff you waste. And you never waste anything, you know, because if you spike a requirement, something else happens. Because the guys don't sit twiddling their thumbs. So it gives them, like, what, the business time to think about the requirement again? Uh, yeah. Today. And very often, when you've really screwed something up, it's kind of a joint and several problem because as a team, you've, you've created the user story and you haven't quite got it right or it hasn't been clear enough to actually deliver something. So it's not just one person who's got it wrong, it's the team who's got it wrong. And the thing that you notice most about Agile is that the team pressure, the peer pressure, where someone's not stepping up and actually doing the work and committing and getting the, the stuff they've committed to being done, the peer pressure is so much stronger than a project manager being on their case and saying, why are you turning up late? Why are you off sick all the time? Why did you promise that you're going to do this today and it's three days later and you haven't done it yet? Um, the peer pressure to deliver and be part of the team and keep that burn down chart going nicely along with the predicted uh, stuff, that's insane. It really makes a difference. Sorry, just one question, Steve. Obviously, um, insurance is an industry that's sort of steeped so much in old school traditions. Sure. So, do you find it presents any unique challenges, or do you think actually it's just as difficult to implement it as insurance as it would be in another uh, sector or industry? That's a really good question, Guy. So, um, my, my take is that humans are humans. And it doesn't matter whether you're in investment banking or telecommunications or insurance or anything. Um, Mostly solving problems is about helping humans to solve those problems together as a team. And um, although insurance is, is probably 10 to 15 years behind the rest of the financial sector in, in terms of IT maturity, um, actually they're just as desperate to get it right as the rest of the financial services sector because of the regulator down their, down their neck. Um, and there's a lot of urgency and a lot of cost pressure to do it right. And if they see something that works that's different from the old stuff that didn't work, they're going to adopt it. Mm. <coughs> Sir? Okay. Uh, two things. First of all, I just want to try to help this colleague with my experience, just mentioning the word Kanban, which has been mentioned by yeah. the presenter before you, because that might be <coughs> one solution to this particular problem. Uh, you obviously referring burn down chart, two week sprints, that is crumb, as you say at the beginning. Yeah. So in some circumstances, different flavors of agile might help certain circumstances. Okay. Don't compromise the basics. Accountability and communications. You compromise them, it's going to go wrong. Um, there are lots of rules and the rules are there actually to make it easy for you not to compromise the basics. 
the, the second one, funny enough, links to what you just mentioned, accountability. What magic do you use to get the business become accountable for something they have never been accountable until now? How can you sell it to them? You don't start until they commit. It's very simple. It's actually not hard. Because, because the conversation goes like this. Fred, can you commit to three days of user acceptance testing Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of the week after next? No. Okay, thank you. I won't start the sprint. I'll do something else. What's wrong with that? That's kind of logical. Why start something you can't finish? And suddenly they say, I'm not getting any work done. I've got to be accountable. I've actually got to step up and do my part in order to get anything. And they might go and complain to mum upstairs, you know, CIO, these IT guys aren't doing what they're supposed to do. Well, did you do what you were supposed to do? Uh, no. Go away. It's pretty straightforward. It's literally, because it's, so, it's such a short period and it's binary, you do this, I'll do that. Want a shake? Okay. No? Next. And we all know about relationships. If you're in a relationship where you keep rolling over and getting beaten, it's abusive. You actually have to have a proper balanced relationship where each party in the relationship has their own responsibilities and accountabilities. And without that, it's toxic. It won't work. Okay, thank, thank you. Very much.